Hello and welcome to Healthline 3. I'm Terry Simmons. Today we're talking with Dr. Karen Birkin of willis Knighton Women's Health Associates about birth control and abnormal uterine bleeding. And we'll be taking your calls all throughout the show. And just as a little reminder for you, just make sure you're in a quiet room with your TV turned down low. Keep the volume low so we can hear your questions when you call in. And the number to call is 318-219-4569. And you'll see it at the bottom of your screen throughout the show. So we look forward to hearing from you. And thank you so much, Dr. Birkin, for being with us. We appreciate it. You're welcome. Pleasure to be here. Well, first of all, let's just talk about birth control. What if, let's start with maybe the, the different reasons to be on birth control. So uh, the obvious reason would be for contraceptive purposes, uh, you know, to prevent pregnancy. Uh, and this starts from, you know, young patients all the way up until, you know, older patients um, that are interested in preventing pregnancy. Uh, another re main reason would be uh, to regulate periods uh, or to make periods less painful, uh, lessen the bleeding or the frequency even of somebody's period if they suffer from uh, particularly bad uh, symptoms when they're on their cycle. Um, those are probably the two most common reasons why we you know, start somebody on birth control. Um, but there's other conditions that we use uh, as, as uh, management for that, things like um, endometriosis, for example, uh, which is a, a condition that can cause some pain, and so we'll regulate uh, that pain by regulating the periods that come along with it. Okay. So. Okay. And what is, like if someone, we say to regulate, what is an abnormal, how will someone know if their, their cycle is really off track? What is something that's not so abnormal periods can be characterized by uh, the amount of bleeding, the length of the bleeding, or just the frequency or infrequency of the period themselves. So the average menstrual cycle uh, is supposed to be between about 24 and 38 days. So if someone is having periods more frequently or less frequently than that, then that's considered abnormal. Uh, also, the actual bleeding episode is only supposed to last for a certain number of days, and around seven to eight is kind of the max that it's supposed to last typically. So if somebody's falling, again, longer than that, uh, then that's also abnormal. Uh, from a heaviness standpoint, that's kind of hard to quantify sometimes, mm -hmm. um, but certainly if, if people are going through sanitary products, you know, many, many, many times a day, uh, even to the point of uh, getting anemic, you know, we, I, we see patients all the time that bleed down to very low levels of, of their blood count from the heaviness of their, of their cycles. And uh, so if someone's bleeding more than 80 milliliters uh, per cycle, then that is considered abnormal. Uh, that equals anywhere from about 14 to 16 teaspoons, which again, hard to quantify, um, but we can get a pretty good sense when somebody comes and talks to us, you know, if, if they say that they're, you know, changing a pad or a tampon, you know, every hour and it's soaked every time, that's too much. And those are good things. Those are really good, definite things to bring up, to make, have, already know that. If mm -hmm. you feel like you want to talk about something that you feel like it's off and it could get better, to have that information, to right. know and bring that in with you, even if you have to kind of watch it for a while and write it down, because that's something you'll ask. So be yeah, prepared no, with how many times, how much you use, how many times you change. Mm -hmm. and, and are the cramps, like is it that individual too, the severity, if it's just more than this person can really handle if right. they call it a 10 and then it's it's considered severe right and and you know everybody has different levels of pain tolerance but and there is some discomfort that sh that comes with a cycle but certainly if someone is not able to control it with the typical over-the-counter medications things like uh, ibuprofen and acetaminophen and whatnot then that's more than than what you should be experiencing uh, and we do often ask when people come into to their appointments you know have you tracked your cycles? You know, they often pull out their iPhone or their, their calendar and they start scrolling through and, and they do, they have everything recorded down and, and it really gives us the ability to, to track things closely um, because sometimes your interpretation of things is not what it actually is. And so if you, if you go down and actually record it, it, it really does help. So that's some really good information today for mm -hmm. anyone watching who might feel like they want to come see you or see, talk to their doctor about it. These are the things to take note of before you get in there. Already know and have mm -hmm. these answers ready. These are the things that you as a doctor is going to ask them yeah, to kind of see what, 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 what to do, how to take care of them. Mm -hmm. And what are the different options for birth control? It's more than just a pill now. Right. 
Uh, so there's thousands of different mm -hmm. options out there. Uh, and I kind of, when I talk to patients about birth control, I split them up into different categories. Uh, some of those categories would be hormonal versus non-hormonal. Um, other ones would be uh, birth controls that are short acting or long acting or um, ones that basically allow you to have a regular cycle or ones that are intended to stop your period altogether. Uh, so to just kind of start uh, touching on that, uh, so if we, if we talk about hormonal and non-hormonal, um, non-hormonal options would be uh, things like condoms, there's a copper IUD, um, which that stands for intrauterine device. Uh, it's basically a device that's placed through a procedure in clinic uh, in the uterus. It's very small, it's shaped like a, the letter T, uh, and it has copper on the core, and in that uh, copper being in your uterus, that does prevent pregnancy. The downside of non-hormonal options is, is they don't help your cycle. So it's not going to affect your period at all because it doesn't have that hormonal aspect to it. Uh, so for people that can't have hormones, uh, for example, uh, medical conditions, uncontrolled high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, stroke, people that have had blood clots, whether in the legs or the lungs, um, people that have really bad headaches, uh, particularly migraines with uh, the aura uh, with them, and then also people over the age of 35 who uh, use uh, tobacco products. Uh, all of those increase the risks that come with taking hormones, and so then that would be a reason as to why we would maybe switch to one of the other types of, of birth control, um, the, the non-estrogen containing uh, birth control. Uh, when we look at uh, some of the short-acting options, those are really popular with the younger population. Uh, so that would be things like the birth control uh, pill, the patch, and uh, the vaginal rings. Uh, those contain, for the most part, two types of hormones, estrogen and progesterone. Uh, and those are the best at achieving a regular monthly period. Now there are versions of those that do not contain that estrogen that are a little bit safer for those at-risk populations. Uh, and there are versions that, or ways to take the birth control to skip periods so that you have a cycle less frequently, uh, whether it's every three months or not at all. Uh, in, in patients that have particularly terrible cycles, it's okay to skip them if need be, uh, and we use medication to do that. Uh, some of the most reliable, longer acting birth controls are going to be the implantable birth controls. So the kinds of birth control that you kind of, I like to say, set it and forget it. You don't have to remember to take a pill every day because the, there is some user error associated with taking a birth control pill. And if somebody's not able to take any birth control the way it's intended, then it's not going to be as effective, whether it's to control your period or to provide birth control. Um, and so some of the longer acting forms of contraception are gonna be uh, the Nexplanon or the uh, subdermal implant, goes right here in your arm. Uh, it's something that we place in clinic and it lasts for three years. Uh, and then there's the intrauterine devices, which there's many different types of those and, and they uh, protect you from pregnancy anywhere from three all the way up to 10 years, depending on which kind. Okay, you're right, there's just so many yeah. options. Uh, so are there any side effects like to the one that like they put in your arm and so all of them have a little bit different side effect profiles and and that's another thing that I really sit down and talk to patients about I, I want to know what they're looking for to, to gain out of being on birth control and then also what they're worried about any side effects that they may have experienced in the past with other types of birth control because you can really find a type that that's best for them uh, for example with the, the birth control pill the most common side effect often is just some nausea from taking the hormone itself. And, and a way to avoid that symptom is to just take it at night right before bed, and then you'll just sleep through that, that uh, nauseated period. Um, other types of birth control while your body's adjusting and getting used to it, uh, you can have some breakthrough bleeding or spotting uh, associated with it, sometimes for a prolonged period of time. Uh, that can be uh, more common with the, the arm implant uh, can cause that also some of the IUDs can cause that for a period of time as well. Uh, but there's ways to uh, reduce the risk of that and also fix that problem if it is happening for too long. 
And as long as patients know what to expect and have reasonable uh, expectations, then they're, they're okay with some of these side effects until they resolve on their own. But they just need to know going in to expect them and to just give it some time for your body to adjust. Okay, just give it some time. Mm -hmm. just, yeah, it is an adjustment. It's doing its work in there. So <laughs> uh, so if someone's watching and say they are taking the pills and they've missed one, what happens if you miss a day? What should you do? Well, so it all depends on kind of where you are in the in the pack and whatnot. So uh, if you're on, typically the last week of a birth control pill pack is what we call placebo pills or sugar pills. So they really don't have any of the medication in them. They're really just placeholders to remind you to take something every day. So if you miss one of those, it's not that big of a deal. But if you miss one of the active hormone pills, um, then you know, depending on, on where you are in the pack and what kind you're on, uh, you know, oftentimes you either resume you know, the next day you know, where, where you left off, but then you have to wait a couple weeks for the medication to take full effect again. Uh, you're not, if you miss a dose, you're not immediately protected once you restart. So that's important for people to know as well. Um, that there is, even though you've restarted the medication, there is a, a, a time frame in there where you need to either avoid or, um, you know, just use alternative forms just because you're not 100% protected at that time. Right, okay. And if you are on birth control and you decide you do want to try to conceive, is there a waiting period between stopping the birth control and, and starting to try to get pregnant? Should you not get pregnant too soon or does it matter? So typically not. Uh, now there are some birth controls, there's a little bit more of a lag uh, before you return back to your normal uh, function. Uh, there's a, a birth control that's been out for a very long time uh, that's very popular. It's called Depo-Provera. It's an injectable form of birth control. Uh, so it's uh, basically a, a larger dose, a higher dose of progesterone that's given uh, via shot uh, every three months. So. You can imagine it's a little bit bigger dose because it has to last for three whole months. Uh, and so with that one in particular, there's a little bit of a lag. You know, it doesn't wear off exactly at the three month period. And so, uh, you know, it takes sometimes several months for people to really resume their normal menstrual cycles after that. Uh, but most of the birth controls, uh, particularly the long-acting ones and then the really short-acting ones, so the, the pills and patches and whatnot, as soon as you stop them, the, med the medicine is gone uh, and you resume fertility very quickly. Okay. Uh, we even use uh, some birth controls, uh, birth control pills a lot of times, if people are not regular with their cycles and they're trying to get pregnant. I know it seems a little counterintuitive that we would use a birth control to help someone get pregnant, um, but we often do in order to regulate someone because we need that regular cycle in order to take it to the next step to, to help them get pregnant. Okay. And so, yes, it's so interesting the different uses mm -hmm. for birth control that you, you don't really, you may not realize that can yeah. help you do all kinds of things. Do you ever have a patient worried that birth control might affect fertility in the future? Does it have any effect on that? Oh, absolutely. I have patients that come in all the time and they say, you know, I've been on this birth control for this many years and, and I'm thinking of getting, you know, starting a family and, and maybe they're, it's a preconception counseling visit and they're, they're not thinking about it right now, they're thinking about it in the next year or so. And, and so I'll tell them, okay, you know, this is a good one to stay on until you're absolutely ready and then you can go ahead and, and get off of it. Or maybe it's one that can kind of linger in their system for a little bit and so I'll say, well, you're not ready just yet, but let's switch you to a kind that will allow you to, to stop and, and basically start trying whenever you do want that option. Okay. Is it harmful to not have a period? It's actually not harmful to have a period. That's one of the kind of big misconceptions. Now, some people actually really like having that, that regular you know, function. They feel like it's the most natural thing. You know, it's what your body does on its own. Um, but uh, most people, um, do ask that question honestly you know they're they're curious if if that's okay to not have a period it's especially okay if your periods are abnormal and you're having a whole lot of pain or really heavy bleeding then sometimes not having a period is a life changer <laughs> uh, and and people are really thankful for that uh, but if you don't have a period you are still 
getting uh, a lot of the hormones that you need from the medication. Uh, and a lot of people don't understand um, just the anatomy and physiology of it. Uh, you know, your, your ovaries make all of the hormone and your uterus just listens to the signals, really. Oh. Uh, your uterus does not do anything other than hold, hold babies and basically get the house ready if a, if a baby were to form. So um, it, it doesn't, the actual period uh, is not really much of a, a factor in your overall health. It's whether uh, you're getting the hormones that you need uh, and that's the more important thing. Uh, some of the birth controls work by just thinning the lining of the uterus so much to where there's just not much there to have a period from every, every month. And so you're still getting everything else that you need, but just have a very, very light uh, actual bleeding episode. Okay. And again, what are the, some of the contraindica contraindications to having birth control? Is there someone who just cannot because of some kind of condition? Yeah, no. Uh, so... Uh, and particularly talking about uh, contraindications to birth control. So there's, I mentioned before, there's uh, estrogen and progesterone. Those are the two hormones that are uh, typically on birth controls. And the estrogen component is the more um, risky of the two. Um, that's the one that uh, has been linked to um, particularly risk of stroke, blood clots in the legs and whatnot. Uh, and so that's the one that we focus more on um, for patients that are over the age of 35 and also are smokers. Um, that's one of the uh, risk factors. Uh, also, if people have uh, really bad migraines with um, the aura beforehand, so whether they see something, smell something um, before their, their migraine uh, comes on, you know, that's a risk factor and a contraindication. Also, any uncontrolled um, medical conditions like uh, uncontrolled high blood pressure, uncontrolled diabetes, if they've had a stroke or a blood clot in the past, those would be reasons not to do an estrogen-containing birth control. Uh, and then also, uh, if someone has a medical condition or, or a clotting disorder, um, there's many different types of disorders out there where um, they're more prone to forming blood clots anyway. Uh, and so if, if they have any of those, then we would not add a second, you know, inciting um, medication that might uh, precipitate that, that blood clot. Okay, so is it good to know all of that about yourself, but also any um, family history or mm -hmm. anything? Is that something that also plays into that? Is it just pretty much individual to the patient herself? Most of it's pretty individual to the patient, but if, if someone comes in and uh, they've had a lot of uh, female cancers or, or related cancers in the family uh, to where maybe they're um, kind of fit, fit the at-risk population for um, having one of the genetic uh, cancer syndromes, um, then that would certainly be something that we would test them for genetically first before maybe giving them extra hormone. Uh, also, if they come in and say that you know every family member that they know of has this certain you know clotting disorder, but they've never been tested themselves, we would test them first um, just because of the high likelihood that they would have it as well. And it's probably another good thing just to bring in to talk to you, even if it's just to alleviate some worries. Mm -hmm. If they've heard in their family or they've heard that that might be a concern, just to bring that in and talk to you about it so you can at least put their mind at rest right. and, and talk to them about what's good for them. Yeah, a lot of a lot of the conversations that we have are just reassurance. You know, they're, they're concerned about something that's what brought them in. And so we talk through whatever the issue is and, and uh, do a workup if need be. But uh, a lot of times it's just reassuring that that falls within the normal range and that it's okay. Yeah. Okay. And is there a, like, what is the most common like conversation you usually have with someone coming in? Is there anything or is it all just across the board? You know, I mean, we hear everything, <laughs> everything. you know, you would, you would not, not imagine all the things that are said uh, in an OBGYN office, but uh, probably the most common in, particularly in the younger population, um, even more so than wanting to get on birth control, it's, they need help with their cycles. Um, you know, they're at the, the early stages of puberty and whatnot, the, the periods are very irregular, they're painful, they're, they can be heavy at times, and, and we're talking about students that are in high school, they're in the middle of class, they're doing all kinds of sporting events, and to have a surprise you know, period in the middle of all yes. that is really difficult, especially at that developmental age. Uh, and so that's probably the most common reason why uh, teenagers come in um, for visits, uh, and then you know, once people get into their upper 30s and their 40s, that's again when 
periods kind of get a little bit out of control um, for various reasons. Uh, they tend to be irregular at the very beginning and at the very end and in the middle, for the most part they're okay. Um, but once hormones change and, and patients are headed more towards menopause and they get some, some decreased hormone levels, that's where some irregularities can happen as well. Okay. And if what's the minimum age if a parent is concerned about their daughter's you know, cycle or periods are just starting or it doesn't seem quite right? Is there a minimum age that you would consider? How much is, how is too young to consider doing this? Uh, there really is no minimum age. Um, we have patients that come in, you know, in their you know, eight, mm -hmm. seven, eight years old, uh, and then there's no maximum age for sure. Uh, typically, unless there's sounds to me to be something very uh, abnormal about what they're telling me, uh, typically I don't need to do an exam at that age though. Uh, we try to actually avoid, you know, doing exams. It can be a bit much, you know, for the, sure. for the younger population and they're, they're always real nervous to come in. And that's the first thing I always tell them is, you don't need an exam today, we're just gonna talk this through. Uh, and then you can just see them, you know, kind of relax after, after you say that. But uh, unless there's a major issue, um, we don't really even start pap smears until, uh, and exams until around age 21. Oh, okay. That's so. good to know too. All right, so let's talk about the uh, abnormal bleeding. What is that exactly? So uh, I know I mentioned earlier, um, just kind of, uh, whether it's the heaviness of the bleeding, the length that the bleeding continues on for, or how frequent or infrequent your periods are, there can be lots of different um, definitions of abnormal uterine bleeding. It's a really broad topic. Uh, and there's lots of causes as well. Um, it can be, uh, there can be um, growths in the uterus called polyps, which can bleed a whole lot. Uh, there can be a condition called uh, adenomyosis, which that word sounds similar to endometriosis. It's a little yeah. similar. Uh, and it's basically where um, the lining of the uterus kind of grows into the muscle itself just a little bit. Oh. And so uh, that's obviously very painful uh, and it can form kind of trapped little pockets of bleeding in the uterus that can't come out. And so that can cause heavier, more painful periods. Uh, one of the most common reasons is fibroids, mm -hmm. though. I'm sure you've heard of fibroids. Um, they're incredibly common. Most people have them, but they're very small and uh, too small to really know they're there or really cause any problems. Uh, but they can grow slowly over time, and they often do. Uh, and that's why in people's upper 30s and 40s, that's the most reason, most common reason why we see uh, periods start to get really heavy and really painful is, is actually fibroids. Um, I've seen people that have, you know, uteruses that get so big they look like they're nine months pregnant. Oh, uh, and it's all just fibroids. They have lots of pressure symptoms, lots of pain from it. Uh, and so um, that's probably the most common reason, you know, in the, in the slightly older population as to why they're having issues. Uh, also one that we always try to rule out is gonna be malignancy. Um, there's, you know, uterine cancer, cervical cancers uh, that, can ca that can cause lots of bleeding symptoms. Um, the advantage of some of those cancers is that bleeding is an early warning sign often. And so unlike some other cancers like ovarian cancer that go unnoticed for a really long time, we have an early warning sign for uterine cancer. And so if someone comes in and says, my periods have always been very regular and now just all of a sudden they're heavy, they're painful, they're very irregular, they come every two weeks, you know, whatever the complaint is, then if they're above the age of 40 or have some other risk factors, then we're automatically going to the next step to do a, a workup for that to rule out malignancy because that's one thing that we definitely don't want to miss. Okay. Um, but there, you know, there's several others. I can go on and on about yeah, causes of, yeah. of abnormal, right. abnormal bleeding. Mm -hmm. um, some of them are what we call iatrogenic, which are just uh, uh, basically us doing something that makes a cycle irregular. You know, I, I talked earlier about uh, someone has uh, birth control or is on different hormones or medications that they can have um, breakthrough bleeding or spotting for a while. Um, so, you know, that can be a cause of abnormal uterine bleeding. If, if we start a medication and then it doesn't take to the patient very well, um, then there can be side effects as, as, um, that are associated. Um, and then there's 
there's hormonal factors, um, ovulatory dysfunction. Uh, if someone's not ovulating regularly, their periods are probably not going to be regular. And, and so that's one of the, the most definitive signs that someone might not be as uh, ovulating as regularly as if they're not having that regular cycle. Okay, oh, that's very interesting that that can happen. There's so many different causes and situations. And pretty much just pay attention to your body. Mm -hmm. Any changes and don't be afraid to come in and ask you. Yeah, absolutely. The, the most important thing that I can say is if, if you're hearing this and you're somewhat mm -hmm. concerned about something or you know something kind of hits you a little bit, just start tracking your periods and go talk to your doctor about it. Um, and, and you know once you have that information you know written down it'll be a lot easier to, to go through and, and find a, a proper solution for it. Okay and when you say tracking your periods tell us the all the information you track if you're what you're feeling the dates how do you what information do you use to track your periods to bring into you? So kind of how you're feeling so oftentimes people do have mood changes mood swings uh, sometimes uh, nausea, pain, uh, you know, all sorts of, um, you know, different uh, emotions can, can happen when people are on their cycles and, and it's due to all the hormones uh, swings that are occurring. So how you're feeling when in your month you're feeling that way, uh, the first day of your period and then the last day, uh, tracking which days are the heaviest, which days are the most painful, uh, and then that gives us a whole lot of information. If you can just kind of keep track of, of when it starts, when it ends, uh, and, and how, how painful and what symptoms you have, then that would be plenty of yeah. information. And emotionally started. how you're feeling yeah. during that time. That's probably an important factor that some of us might not think to let you know too. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think we have Amanda on the line. Amanda, thanks for calling. What's your question? Uh, yes, ma'am. I was concerned. Um, I'm 45 years old. And um, I had a hysterectomy 20 years ago. And now I am going through, like, major hot flashes. Um, they took my ovaries, but they left my uterus. So I'm kind of con Is there anything that we can possibly do to help correct that? So if, if I heard you correctly, so you said that you had a hysterectomy. It was about 20 years ago. Um, but you're, you believe that they left your uterus but took your ovaries, is that correct? Yes, they did. They took my ovaries, but they left my uterus. Okay. Um, so, the, so since you've had that surgery, uh, have you had any periods at all? Oh, no, absolutely not. So I would, if they had, if they had said to you, I would, I would definitely maybe contact that doctor that that did the surgery. There may be a little bit of, of miscommunication there because oftentimes, um, when you've had a hysterectomy, and what that means is removing your actual uterus, um, and then uh, the terminology has kind of changed over the years. People will say complete hysterectomy or partial hysterectomy, um, and we've kind of changed that terminology a little bit over the years, but. Uh, a hysterectomy itself is removing your uterus, and what people would, would allude to is a complete hysterectomy. That meet, they were kind of um, talking about at the time that was your ovaries coming out as well. We've changed all that now. A hysterectomy is a hysterectomy. It's removing your uterus, um, and then we can take your ovaries in the same surgery, or we can leave them untouched and, and leave all of your hormones intact. Um, so I, it would be... A, a strange situation for someone to take your ovaries but leave your uterus that doesn't typically happen um, so I would be interested to know kind of why you had the surgery and you know kind of some of the circumstances around that um, the reason why I had it was because I had endometriosis really bad okay and so with endometriosis uh, the the fuel for endometriosis is is the um, estrogen that would come from your ovaries so I mean that would be a reason to to take the ovaries if you did have endometriosis really bad and for the for the viewers to kind of understand um, what endometriosis is uh, it's basically where uh, cells uh, from your uterus that respond to hormone and bleed and cause inflammation monthly uh, have have escaped they've made it out of your uterus somehow there's lots of different theories as to how that happens um, the most 
a common theory is, is by uh, some bleeding going backwards and kind of actually spilling out of the tubes and, and resting in the, in the pelvis uh, with each cycle. And those microscopic cells can just kind of implant throughout the pelvis uh, and they basically set up shop there and they, uh, they get a little bit of a blood supply, they respond to hormones, they bleed and they cause lots of pain, um, adhesions and, and inflammation uh, on a monthly basis. It's one of the, the most common causes for pelvic pain. Um, and so taking your ovaries certainly would remove, would remove the fuel for um, that endometriosis. Okay. Um, you may okay. have hot flashes from, uh, you know, those menopausal um, symptoms, that loss of those hormones. Um, and there's ways to replace those hormones um, or if you don't want to risk the endometriosis flaring again, there's other medications that we can sometimes use to treat the symptom itself instead of the overall problem, which is the lack of estrogen. Okay. Well, Amanda, thank you so much for calling. We're going to be put up the information too to reach Dr. Birkin in case you want to follow up and ask more uh, questions and go to the website or call. So thank you so much for your question. And Dr. Birkin, thank you for spending time with us today. This has been really informative. Yeah, of course. We really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. All right, everyone, have a good afternoon. Take care, and we'll see you next time on Helpline 3.